It has been said that Texas is so wrapped up in myth and legend, it's hard to know what the state and its people are really about. That real Texans, raised on these myths and legends, sometimes become legends themselves. Ah, Texas. Where men are men, and demons are demons. At least, that's the case in tonight's story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so I could read your stories to you. And so, my dear friends, here we are again on another Monday, the start of a week in which I will entertain you as best I can. Are you ready? Yes, well, I think it's time to once again sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. My name is Maxwell Lawson, and I have a uh, unique career. <laughs> I hunt demons. Yes, demons. Those nasty, supernatural, devilish creatures. I live in the heart of Texas, in the middle of the state, in the city of San Antonio. It's a large city that lies at the crossings of desert, coastal flats, rocky hills, and forests. It's a good city the great cost of living and a perfect end, virtually equal proximity to anywhere else in the state. The food is also fantastic. There's a rich cultural history here as well, with Latin American and German influences being the most prevalent. Not to mention that San Antonio is our nation's seventh largest city. It's also one of our largest military cities as well. I work for the Texas Rangers, but I'm not exactly a Texas Ranger, per se. I was trained under the Rangers after leaving the Marine Corps due to an honorable discharge. I'd suffered an injury during an operation in Afghanistan. My foot was blown off due to an explosion that occurred at an undisclosed encampment. I have a prosthetic that serves me just fine these days. I was also honorably discharged for another reason as well. You see, I have... An ability. Call it a sixth sense, if you will. I can see things. Well, premonitions in a way. I get these dreams that stay rooted in my memory and are often prophetic. I can sense when something is about to uh, go down, so to speak. I also have a very capable skill of fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. I can almost see an opponent's move before it happens. I'm not a very large fellow, though. I stand about 5'8", and weigh about 176 pounds. But I'm very disciplined at my craft of fighting and fitness. I don't like weight training, personally, but do just enough to keep my strength above average. Oh, and I hate cardio. I keep in shape by playing basketball and racquetball, primarily. I do, however, fastidiously train in my own devised martial arts, Weapons training and meditation. Now, I stated that I hunt demons, which is a very broad and vague statement. There are many levels and ranks of demons, ranging from impish, troublesome creatures all the way up to the mighty and distinguished demon dukes, lords and presidents. The ones I hunt are the minor ones, in the grand scheme of things. Now... These minor demons are capable of horrific acts of gruesome physical, spiritual, and psychological terror. They're not to be taken lightly under any known circumstances. Some possess insidious malice, cruelty, and brutality, while others are simply mischievous and even comical and funny. Some demons are literally helpful and benevolent in their nature. There is one thing that all demons have in common, though. They all come from hell. Because of this, they are all inherently evil. Even the most benevolent of the demons have an evil and dark agenda, and should never, under any circumstances, be trusted, even in the slightest. They serve their masters and their own agendas, even when summoned by a skillful demonologist. Now, to fight a demon or an evil spirit is very tricky. The phrase, it takes one to know one, is profoundly applicable in these situations. All of the weapons I use and all of the tactics I employ are, what I like to say, <coughs> demonized. My standby is a modified custom 357 Magnum with an extended barrel that extends two inches further than a traditional 357. 
It's a deep indigo, with an ivory inlay that was hand-carved from the tusk of an elephant that Pope John Paul II blessed personally. The metal forged to create this gun was retrieved in a cask of ancient holy water that was over 500 years old. The rusted hunk of metal was honed and honed over and over again to create the barrel. The bullets are always blessed by the caseload by a representative from the Vatican in Italy. The insignia on the handle was that of a cross that was made inside of a pentagram. The insignia symbolized the paradoxical nature of our existence. This insignia was also created in an emblem that I wore on a necklace as well as a tattoo in the center of my chest, with five stars branded around the tattoo. The insignia was cursed in a literal sense, but not in a dangerous manner. The insignia would glow slightly and radiate heat from the handle of the gun when I was near any demons or evil entities. I also had three custom throwing knives of blessed steel, and three ceramic ones as well, undetectable by metal detectors. I had two 9mm Glock custom pistols with holsters on each ankle. I also have two small swords, forged from the same metal my gun was made from. The swords, as well as all my other weapons, bore the engraved phrase, Non timebor mala, which is Latin for, I will fear no evil. I also had an array of disguises that were essential for infiltrating cults and maintaining secrecy. Aside from my birth name, Max, I had three other aliases that I utilized. They were Mark Withers, Corey Altmaier, and Victor Lamsky. My linguistics was my weakness, though, only speaking English and poorly executed Spanish. I'd lost track of the cost of all my weapons and equipment when it hit $300,000. I was paid handsomely for most of my missions, I did, however, take on many charity pro bono cases. My benefactors were wealthy private businessmen, state government law enforcement, and federal government agencies such as the CIA. I was a fairly wealthy man, but lived a solitary life, seldom calling upon the company of others. I had few relations with women as well. Attachments became liabilities in this business. I love what I do. But it's not the life for a social butterfly. I've always been a very easy-going guy. Soft-spoken and shy, but confident and tactful. Oh, and I love cats. I have three. Puka, Chucky, and Athena. I received a ping from my dark web contact, who went by the name Dark Angel the other day. I can't divulge his real name or whereabouts for the sake of anonymity. Dark which is what I called him, had some information about a cult presence developing in the border city of Eagle Pass, Texas. There were reports of a pestilence that was killing livestock and house pets. Some 16 dogs, 20 cats, and dozens of chickens and goats were reported missing or dead. The dead animals that were recovered were totally void of their eyes, teeth, nails, and much of their skin, but otherwise intact. I picked up my gear jumped into my custom rebuilt Ford Bronco and went to my occult contact. Her name was Agneta Contreras, a small and slightly heavy-set Hispanic woman in her sixties. I pulled into her driveway, which was a small two-bedroom house in south side of San Antonio. I walked in. Aggie, it's Max, I said. Ay, mijo she said cheerfully, as she came in from the kitchen. I kissed her on the cheek and said, oh, I need the usual. I'm heading to Eagle Pass on a job. I may need to cross the border. Oh, sure, sure, sit down. I just made coffee, she said as she patted me on the back. Well, I don't have much time. I, uh, I started to say, no, no, she snapped at me. You have time. Eagle Pass isn't going anywhere. She said laughingly. I just made migas and steaks and fresh tortillas. She said with dutiful excitement. Well, my stomach began to growl at the sight and smell of the food she was finishing up. Her cooking was the stuff of legends. She made homemade flour tortillas and coffee and juice. Her coffee was always strong, 
and wonderfully brewed via French press. The silver cream boat and sugar cup was already on the table. <laughs> well, I can't turn down your breakfast, that's for sure, I laughed and said. I began to devour the migas, which was a common concoction of scrambled eggs, corn tortilla chips and cheese. The steak was a thin-cut sirloin that was ever so tender and perfectly cooked as well. Oh, I'm going to need the usual, for board emissions that is, I told her with a mouthful of food. I put the tackle box on the table for her. When she took it from me and said, oh, Okay, let me get the stuff ready for you. She brought out the box filled with herbs to put in my tea packets that she made from scratch. There were also packets of blessed substances that were for me to take on my journey. She also had a dark web contact that supplied her with fresh opium that I could put in a tiny marijuana pipe and smoke if I had any injuries. Taking three or four drags from an opium pipe was like popping Percocet or two, only no paper trail. Oh, you're the best, I said as I gave her a big hug and a kiss. <laughs> I know I am, and don't you forget it, she said to me with a wry smile. I laughed back at her. Hey, where's Carlos? I asked. Oh, he's at the store for me today. My ankle is hurting too bad. Um, need anything when I get back? I asked. Oh, just two gallons of milk, sweetie, if you can, she replied. Okay, will do. You know how to reach me, if you need anything else, I said as I left for the trip. She was like a second mother to me, as mine had passed away due to a fatal car accident. The trip was wholly uneventful and took about two hours. The contact gave me the location of the mansion on the outskirts of town right on the border. As soon as I reached town, I noticed something in a field to my left about a hundred feet off the shoulder. I jumped out of the truck and sensed the evil immediately. It felt like an ever so minute spike of adrenaline. This was due to the ability I possessed. It was the carcass of an animal, maybe a goat or a dog. As I approached, I realized it was a goat. It didn't smell too bad, as it looked like it was dead for only about ten hours or so. I examined the animal with latex gloves from the tackle box that were provided for me. The eyes were gone, and the hooves had been removed as well. The goat was otherwise intact and untouched. This was a senseless waste, and cruel. There were so many bizarre rituals being performed everywhere. Every ritual has its quirks, too. These rituals were like entertainment for demons. The goal is to attract and produce an alluring atmosphere for them. This goat could feed a family with its meat for a week, or milk for an indefinite period of time. I knew I was close now. I jumped back into the truck and headed toward the GPS coordinates provided for me by my dark web contact. I checked the weather report for the afternoon in Eagle Pass, and it was forecasting sunny skies and highs of around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The sky was becoming an obscure, dark green-gray color, totally opposite of what the forecast had indicated. Lightning began to pepper the ground frequently. No rain had begun to fall, however. This was common during a demonic episode. Dark skies, lightning with no rain. I was approaching the mansion when I noticed that there was a sophisticated security system surrounding the property. There were about six or seven vehicles parked outside of the building. I waited until nightfall before making my move. I parked the truck about a quarter mile away and covered the truck with a camouflage tarp that was supplied by my tactical equipment contact. I started the hike back toward the mansion at around midnight, reaching the perimeter in about 20 minutes or so. I'd found a hole in the fencing near the back side of the house. I took out a pair of night vision binoculars and could see two guards by the back entrance to the large house. I was able to creep up to within six feet of the guards, which was perfect distance for my throwing knives. I procured two of them, which were very capable of taking down someone in minutes. Now, throwing knives are not like in the movies, where you can throw it from twenty feet away and kill someone silently. No, oh, I use them with a special toxin that will put someone to sleep in a matter of three minutes or so. 
This instant kill garbage was all Hollywood. Throwing knives take a lot of practice. They are a lot of fun if you can master them, but it's all about repetition, repetition, repetition. I could hit a dart-sized bullseye from about ten feet, nine out of ten throws, and that took months of practice to get so accurate. They were totally silent, though, and excelled within the element of surprise. I threw on first to the guy on the left and hit him in the back. He yelped and said, What the f- and then dropped in about 20 seconds. The second guy stooped over to see what happened to his partner. I hit that guy in the back of the shoulder. He pulled out the knife and said, then collapsed as well. They would be out for an hour or so, so I had to move quickly. I took the overcoat and hat from one of the guards I'd subdued and put them on. I strolled into the vast living room. It had been converted into a dark magic chapel. There was an altar the size of a car in the rear center of the room. It was covered in blood, but I wasn't sure from what. I strolled near to the back of the room, pretending to make rounds as a guard would do. I noticed there was a man in a dark robe at the back of the altar, who was chanting in tongues of some sort. I knew the sound of demon summoning when I heard it. The ghastly sight of two flayed and butchered goats sat upright on stilted spikes as sacrifices. Above the man chanting was a black hole that was rotating in a circular motion. My gun and chest emblem began to glow, indicating it was showtime. I needed to get these demons as soon as they crossed over, or they would unleash carnage. My intel explained that these demons were summoned for the destruction of a rival cartel. Now, we can do without more cartels in the world, but these fools were summoning demons that could wreak havoc and end the lives of countless innocent people. I waited in my disguise to see what kind and how many demons were about to show up. When I saw them appear, I knew what they were right away. These were a lesser demon called Grimuls. They were command and kill assassins. They always followed the conjurer's orders as long as he or she was alive. They're aimless when not under command and tend to wander the earth, killing indiscriminately. They were a four on the demon power scale of one to ten. Now, this scale was very much like the pain scale, ten being the most powerful. Grimmels can move very quickly and had a deadly strike. They stand about six feet tall and have large bulbous heads with tall, bat-like ears. They don't fly, but can teleport about twice an hour. They're not very intelligent, but are deadly nonetheless. They were thin and wiry, with hands five times that of a man's with razor-sharp claws. They have an appearance that resembles a humanoid form that is also bipedal. Their main advantages were their speed, agility, and the poisonous claws. Wounds from these demons grow gangrenous in a matter of hours. Basically, Grimuls are the low-ranking hitmen of hell, so to speak. But their main disadvantage was their carelessness. I've handled several of these guys in the past and wasn't too worried. The summoner must be kept alive, or the demons would disperse somewhere else, sometimes back to hell or to another place on earth. And just like me, they can sense and smell me as well. They're immediately attracted to a fight, no matter how big the adversary, making them both dangerous, but stupid and predictable. I quietly left the summoning room and went into the long halls, looking for the demons. They were in the house awaiting instructions from the conjurer. My amulet glowed brighter as I got closer and closer. The rooms were pitch black. I put on my night vision goggles. I could hear debris being tossed and tumbled in one of the rooms ahead. I pulled out a pouch of powder from my pocket and took a pinch between my thumb and forefinger. The powder is ground human bones that's used as an attractant or a diversion. I snapped my finger with the powder and it puffed out. Then 
its ghastly scream erupted. It sounded like the combination of a screaming woman blended with a swine squeal. God, you guys are always so damn noisy, I said aloud, as one of them erupted out of one of the rooms and into the hallway to face me. I had my revolver ready as it started toward me with unholy and unnatural speed. I drew and fired at the demon. The bullet hit with a hiss that made the demon's glowing red body turn black and explode into fine, black ashen powder. The powder then disappeared immediately, as if nothing had happened. I changed the song on my headphones to Iron Maiden's Ace is High, and said, One down, one more to go. Iron Maiden was my favorite heavy metal band. I proceeded further, and heard a rush and screeching sound behind me. I whirled around to see the other one climbing on the ceiling. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that they were excellent climbers. I spun on my heel and fell to my back, facing upward underneath the creature, and fired. It erupted in a cloud of black ash that fell all over my face. Oh, damn it, I hate it when that happens. I cursed in frustration as the black ash began to disintegrate. And now it was time to eliminate the conjurer. The conjurer must be confronted before being killed. The confrontation part is for the disruption of the conjuring. The realization must be met by the conjurer. Once this occurs, the portal will begin to close. Killing a conjurer before he has the chance to stop can cause a portal to not be fully closed, and these half-closed portals were called rips. The reason to kill the conjurer was for preventative measures. There cannot be the element of risk that these conjurers will do it again. A leftover rip can cause further infestations and hauntings from not only demons but malevolent spirits as well. Killing the conjurer is the safest and easiest way to stop the cycle. Rips take three skilled conjurers to close. I went into the main chamber and found the man who was completing the conjuring on a cell, speaking Spanish to someone on the other line. He was explaining the situation regarding a rival cartel across the border. That's all I could surmise, anyway. I gave the guy a whistle, making him jump in surprise. Who the hell are you? He said. Your worst nightmare, I said. I know, I know, cheesy and cliche, but I couldn't resist. You've opened a portal of untold evil, and you must either turn yourself in to the authorities or die. Choose now, I said routinely, like I've said it dozens of times before. <laughs> die? <laughs> no, my friend, you are going to die, he said. I summon thee to kill this man, he commanded out loud. Nothing happened. Oh, they're gone, as well as your portal, I said, as the portal began to shrink and disappear. No, it can't be, he said incredulously. Afraid so, buddy, I responded. Get him, now, he called to his men on a walkie-talkie. I crouched down behind a large metal statue and waited. I saw four men approach with silenced handguns. A barrage of bullets came at me as I was crouched behind the statue. I crouched down low to make myself as small a target as possible. I then took aim and shot one of the men in the chest and the other in the head. The two were firing wildly at me as I began to roll low to the right. One of the bullets grazed my forearm. I could feel the beasting like jolt of pain erupt in my arm. Damn it, you're getting sloppy and overconfident, I told myself in frustration. I trained my gun and shot a third henchman in the chest. I took aim at the last one as he ducked behind the altar with the boss man. I missed as the bullet tore a chunk of concrete from the corner of the altar. Now, the bullets I use were a very high quality hollow point. Being that my armor was also blessed meant that it could effectively combat demons, as well as regular villains, of course. The remaining henchman threw a canister of what appeared to be tear gas. 
Oh, shit, I said as I pulled out a fine cloth bandana to cover my mouth and nose. It helped a little, as long as I kept low. I saw a figure walking in the gassy mist with a gas mask on. I took aim and put a bullet through his temple. I then grabbed the boss man by the collar and dragged him outside the house and said, You're really beginning to piss me off now, so you have one chance to turn yourself into the authorities who are on their way, or die right here, right now. Your choice. The sound of distant sirens began to emanate from the end of the street. Fine, I'll turn myself in. Just don't kill me, he pleaded. I didn't have a choice. They kidnapped my cousin in Guadalajara. I had to do something, he pleaded. You chose this life on your own. You'll have your day in court like everyone else, I said, as two police officers began to cuff him. The Eagle Pass PD was informed of my presence and was told not to appear until I gave the signal. The signal was a simple GPS beacon that resembled a small remote control. I used this to call in the local cavalry when arrests were to be made. Well, after packing up my equipment and cleaning my gun with a blessed sacral vial of gun oil, I jumped back in the truck. The drive was the longest two hours of my life. The tear gas and adrenaline wore me out, and sleep wanted to come in a bad way. I stopped at a convenience store to get a can of high-gravity cheap malt liquor and a 10-ounce orange juice. I mixed it together and poured it on ice. I took a long drink of the concoction that I called the poor man's brass monkey. Hey, it's my one vice. I enjoy one every day. I also remembered to pick up Aggie a couple of gallons of milk as well. I finally came home and plopped down on the couch and Puka, the more affectionate of my three cats, jumped up on my lap. I fell asleep in minutes until I was awoken by a sound. I awoke somewhat disoriented and looked around. My computer pinged. On the screen, Dark had left me a message on my homepage that said, we have a situation in El Paso. I sighed and groaned. I slept for about seven hours and was quite rested until my laptop pinged again with another message from Dark. Feeling spontaneous? Jeez, he's always such a smartass. I laughed and replied, Okay, what's up? Well, that was a fantastic one, wasn't it? What did you think of that? Please let me know in the comments section below, and I'll take a look and ch chat as much as I possibly can with you all. <laughs> I say that every week, don't I? Yes, I do, I know. And, well, it looks like that could be the start of a new series. Just finished a series up last night, the Vigilante series I've been reading on Sundays for you. And, as some of you have guessed, it's not in fact the end, because it starts all over again with a new series. One which I've already read the first part of, so, if you're looking for a continuation, go back in my uh, back catalogue for a couple of weeks and find the story about the bank robber, because that's where the new series continues. Well, that's enough for me for one evening, but of course I will be back again on Wednesday, and if all goes to plan, it will be a two-hour epic. But that's enough for one evening, so sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?